Sri Lanka's ancient irrigation systems continue to be phenomena, wondrous works that have been cited even at the International Court of Justice. This behind me is the Parakrama Samudra or the Sea of King Parakrama Bahu, constructed in about 386 AD. It is 8.5 miles in length and 40 feet in height, a water body covering nearly 5,500 acres. The short-sighted project to dig up the breakwater of this legacy left by our kings, which continues to be the lifeblood of over 18,000 acres of paddy land, was fortunately shelved. For the moment, this reservoir is safe. Welcome to Prime Group Kaleidoscope with me, Savitri Rodrigo, and your weekly dose of daring, positive, different. Up ahead is organic, the new colonialism, cardboard coffins going places, the Chitrasena dancers in Berlin and a female first in shipping. Welcome to 88 residents Kathadua. Invest just 3 million and own your dream home. Pay 25% in two and a half years, 55% at the handover with zero interest. Prices starting from 14.5 million. 0710 88 Residence Prime Group. This is our snapshot and a quick look at the week that was. Having weathered some bad storms due to the pandemic, Sri Lanka's listed companies made a phenomenal 117% recovery by the second quarter of 2021. Banks are the largest contributor with 25%. The Central Bank of Sri Lanka has requested banks to keep the US dollar exchange rate at a maximum of 203 rupees to a US dollar. Advocata's Bhatkara indicator sees a 30% year-on-year price increase in our humble pack of rice and curry. Nearly 1,500 flowering plant species in the wet zone of Sri Lanka are now listed as being critically endangered. The Liberty in Boston, Clink 78 in London and the Alcatraz in Germany were all jails that were converted to hotels. On a similar theme, Sri Lanka will transform the Valikada prison into a hotel. Known as an architectural masterpiece, Venice's Rialto Bridge was serenaded by Andrea Bocelli when it reopened after a 5 million euro restoration. That's our snapshot this week. Welcome to our news capsule. This week, the Sri Lanka Treasury released a comprehensive document titled Investment Opportunities in Rising Sri Lanka 2022, listing specific opportunities in promising sectors including power and energy, pharmaceuticals, textiles, real estate, urban development, fisheries and aquaculture, port city, travel and tourism and aviation. Real estate and urban development accounts for the most number of projects with three Selandiva projects, Colombo Hilton, Grand Hyatt Colombo and Grand Oriental Hotel estimated to rake in around 550 million US dollars. Helming the voice of the shipping industry in Sri Lanka, the Ceylon Association of Shipping Agents or CASA has a new chairman. Shehara De Silva made history when she was elected the first female chair of CASA since its inception in 1944. The shipping industry has seen challenging times and I asked Shehara how she plans on navigating these stormy waters. Today, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused havoc in global supply chains with congestion in ports all over the world and also a shortage of space and equipment for importers and exporters. Through our regular dialogue with stakeholders, government agencies, regulatory bodies and other private sector agencies, CASA seeks to effect an interchange of ideas and information and also provide solutions to the issues of the industry. The persistent devaluation of the Sri Lankan rupee has unfortunately led to foreigners selling Lankan equities with year-to-date net outflows topping the 41 billion rupee mark. 
After the recent gains at the Colombo Stock Exchange, this week the All Share Price Index moved down by 3.6%, with the daily turnover averaging 8.4 billion rupees. Slow growth in China and Saudi Arabia slashing prices for Asia made WTI oil remain around 69 US dollars per barrel level this week. While a stronger US dollar and higher bond yields kept gold prices trading at 1,794 US dollars per ounce. Sri Lanka's cardboard coffins have been making world headlines and are now making a maiden voyage too. Two containers of 1,100 cardboard coffins are being shipped out to Vietnam. The coffins are the brainchild of the ardent environmentalist and conservationist, the Hivala Mount Lavinia Municipal Councillor Priyanta Sahabandhu, who collaborated with Sri Lankan company Pakwell Lanka to produce these coffins, which by the way, are less than one-tenth of the price of a regular coffin. <laughs> Cardboard coffins have a two-fold advantage. We are saving trees which are used in the manufacture of wooden coffins and secondly, it provides relief to people who are unable to afford a regular wooden coffin which costs over rupees 30,000. With debts increasing due to the pandemic, we decided to manufacture cardboard coffins which actually cost less than rupees 5,000, making it affordable and stopping the felling of trees. Our efforts are now recognized globally. We just shipped these coffins to Vietnam and are in discussion with the Philippines and Singapore who want to distribute it to the whole of Southeast Asia. These initiatives will add foreign exchange to the country and also help the world become more green by reducing our carbon footprint. Husbands, if you thought you were going through hell and high water, think twice. Some 40 husbands carried their wives through rough terrain in a wife-carrying contest in Hungary. The race has its origins in the Viking Age. Welcome to 88 Residence Skatedua. Invest just 3 million and own your dream home. Pay 25% in two and a half years, 55% at the handover with zero interest. Prizes starting from 14.5 million. 0710 88 Residence Prime Group. Is organic the new colonialism? Rohan Petyagoda believes it is so. Coming up next on Prime Group Kaleidoscope Selling Collive, let's talk. World of risks and obstacles, we are there to help you reach your goals. With 12 billion rupees worth of customer benefits in 2020 and a life insurance fund worth over 100 billion rupees, our strength is your strength. You focus on your goals, we will take care of the risks. Selling Life. It's a way of life that gained momentum not too long ago and has quickly caught on. Entire nations are using the word like second nature. And that word is organic. Have you ever wondered what going organic actually means? It lays no claim to science. Organic deals with agricultural practice, not with food safety. And most people think organic means free of chemicals and good to eat. On Serico Life, let's talk today is Rohan Petiagoda, a taxonomist, winner of the Rolex Award for Enterprise for his conversion of an abandoned tea plantation into natural forests, and a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences. He's a widely published author who is credited with discovering almost 100 new species of vertebrates from Sri Lanka. So your perception is that organic is a foreign certification system designed for consumers in foreign countries. You say that it is the new colonialism with the West telling us how to do things. How did you come to this conclusion? Absolutely, I, I do insist that this is a new form of colonialism, but my reason for saying that is, is, is not the usual reason. I find that many people who use this term organic haven't really thought through what it means. Basically, organic farming denies the use of modern agrochemicals, pesticides, herbicides, and so on. In effect, it practices farming as it was practiced prior to 1900. So it's, it's quite an old technology. This means that crop yields are substantially lower, usually between 20 and 40% lower than the yields we get from conventional agriculture. So the cost of producing a kilo of organic tea or organic rice is typically 20 to 40% higher in the organic system than in the conventional system. But consumers won't pay that premium price, 20 to 40% more, unless they have an assurance that the rice or tea is in fact organic. 
And this is where the certification agencies come in. There are seven foreign certification organizations operating in, in, in Sri Lanka. Six of them are European and one of them is Australian. They all claim to be non-profit. So these so-called non-profit certification agencies make their money by charging every single farmer between $300 and $600 a year to certify their produce as organic. Now, if that isn't colonialism, what is? Because there are foreign agencies insisting that we pay this money so that we can label our product such that it can get into their markets. So now we have in Sri Lanka a million rice farmers and 400,000 tea farmers. Let's forget about the vegetable people for the moment. There's probably another half a million there. They are the backbone of our economy. And the organic certification agencies now stand to cream off as a result of these annual fees that every farmer is required to pay in order to have organic labels on his produce. 400 to 800 million dollars a year from the Sri Lankan economy. The hypocrisy of this business is simply not worth talking about. And that's why I talk about it as being the new colonialism. You have just put a spoke in the wheel of all those touting the goodness of organic food being safe, saying that the perception of organic food being absolutely safe is an illusion. So, are organic products not as safe or are they not as healthy as it is made out to be? I'm not for a moment denying that organic food is safe. But I also argue that conventional food is safe. There's very little or no evidence in the scientific literature, and there's thousands of studies done every year all over the world, suggest that conventional agriculture is in the least bit unsafe. But let's put it this way. There's no scientific evidence that organic food is any safer than conventionally farmed food. So the thing to remember is that all foods carry risks. It's up to producers and regulators and consumers to minimize those risks. Just by blindly following an ideology doesn't make food safe. People who eat organic food are very likely in any case to be health conscious. I can't think of many organic food aficionados who would, for example, be smokers or who would be obese or who would be eating lots of sweets. They tend to be healthy. So naturally they would have better life health outcomes. But this is not because of the food they eat alone. It's because they are more likely to be conscious of their health in general. You can't just think that organic food by itself is going to make you healthier. It has to be part of a total lifestyle. It has to be part of a conscious and cautious way of consuming food. And that's an important thing in itself. But both conventional and organic agriculture can give you that. So with Sri Lanka moving towards organic farming, what do you think we need to be aware of? Of course, besides all that you said about the foreign certifications and also the costs involved, what else should we be aware of? Every organic farm has to operate now under the SLS 1324 standard. That's 85 pages of fine print. Now think about the average level of education and economic ability of our farmers. They come from the lowest socioeconomic stratum in Sri Lanka. And we are thrusting this 85 page document of fine print, most of it which makes no scientific sense, and saying you have to follow this and pay your three to six hundred dollars a year to a foreign agency in order to be eligible to sell your food. I think that's fundamentally unfair. So that's that's going to result in a social problem and you will have a revolt from the farming community. Uh, mark my words, unless the government steps away from this, we are going to have a 1971 kind of insurrection from the farmers. But compulsory nationwide organic farming is another matter altogether. It will be an economic and environmental disaster. So Rohan surmises that going into total organic farming for Sri Lanka will be an environmental and economic disaster. His suggestion, get hold of the experts and start a dialogue and then what we need to see is whether the country can afford it. That was Rohan Petyagoda on Selling for Life. Let's talk. Three generations of Chitrasena dancers are performing in a completely new setting in Berlin this month. They are dancing in augmented reality in a first ever for Sri Lanka. Collaborating with the artist collective Reverb in Berlin, Transient Exposure features five female artists 
on different continents. Artistic Director of the Chitrasena Dance Company, Heshma Vignaraja, is on Life in 60 today. The new production, Transient Exposure, is a mixed reality installation about the contemporary in dance, where three generations of artists from the Chitrasena family explore the shrinking space for the traditional arts in the context of rapid development. The audience gets to experience our story this time in a virtual and augmented reality platform. So six years ago, two wonderful women from Germany, Isabel Robson and Suzanne Winson, initiated this collaboration. And with the support of XR Unites and the Goethe Institute and a few more wonderful artists from Berlin, um, we have managed to put something beyond our wildest imagination. So did you like our show today? Please press the like sign on YouTube and do subscribe to Kaleidoscope with Savitri Rodrigo on YouTube and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. We continue to be in lockdown. Do stay safe and make safety a priority. Mask up. So until we catch up with you again next week on Prime Group Kaleidoscope, on our Kaleidoscope Takeaway, here are the wise words of King Parakrababahu. Do not release even a drop of rainwater into the sea without using it. <laughs>